join me in welcoming David Rodowick. Hi, thanks. And like everyone else, I really want to thank uh, Megan and Sarah and all the uh, organizers of the conference. It's been a, a fascinating day so far. Uh, I'll get right to it. Questioning Roland Barthes' assertion that every photograph is a certificate of presence, Akbar Abbas notes that there is also an affinity between photography and disappearance. Disappearance, too, he offers, is more a matter of presence rather than absence, of superimposition rather than erasure. How then to figure or express the presence of disappearance, and how to comprehend the affinity between photography and disappearance? The multiple disappearings of photography and new variations of time in the image are powerful features of our digital age. And if photography has now become image in a new sense, this means that the presence of disappearing cannot be given in representation, at least as ordinarily understood. If photography has an affinity with disappearance, it would, less, it would be less in making past presence visible than in making perceptibly, or at least mentally present, something that hovers between presence and absence, the subjective and the objective, the actual and the virtual, spatial presence and temporal absenting. This mixing and reversibility of terms is not limited to the history of photography. Um, here I want to bring into the conversation uh, uh, both Ro Rosalind Krauss's sculpture of the expanded field and George Baker's photography's expanded field. Have no fear, I will not lead you through new variations of Klein groups and semiotic squares. Rather, I only want to note that neither Krauss's diagrams nor Baker's identify conceptual overlaps between photography and sculpture. Yet, if we think in terms of presence and absence, actual and virtual, space and time, superimposition and erasure, we are led intuitively to many examples of sculptural expression that evoke or alter concepts of photography. I'm thinking here, it's like a thought bubble hovering over my head. <laughs> I'm thinking here of Robert Morris's Mirrored Cubes from 1965. Historically, and despite all postmodernist protestations, we tend to think of photography and sculpture as two distinct regimes of visibility. Ph photography as a representation deployed in two dimensions and limited by a frame, a transcription of past presence in space and time, now given to percep perception as an absence, and sculpture as a presentation in three dimensions, occupying space materially and volumetrically in direct confrontation with vision at variable distances. Of course, as I have never tired of insisting in my work on the figural, all such oppositions and definitions of medium sustained by uh, criteria of identity are destined to come to grief. Krauss was among the earliest critics to assert this fact in noting that the condition of postmodernism in sculpture is defined by ontological absence. The conclusion in her canonic essay is that within the situation of postmodernism, practice is not defined in relation to a given medium, for example, for example sculpture, but rather in relation to the logical operations on a set of cultural terms for which any medium, photography, books, lines on walls, mirrors, or sculpture itself might be used. And you will recall that uh, later in his essay, Baker reprises this argument, but substitutes uh, photography for sculpture. Oops. One might consider Morris's mirrored cubes in exactly this way, except for the fact that their volumetric presence does not present an opaque surface, but rather optically virtual images nearly indistinguishable from their immediate surroundings. These reflections are not transparencies, but rather representations of the situational space of the objects wrapped around the visible five sides of the cubes. The cubes will inevitably reproduce the physical characteristics of their environments with the automatic precision of photography, although without the characteristic of permanent transcription. 
Moreover, as each of the five sides of the cubes are squares of equal size and proportion, these surfaces might be imagined as frames, capturing space in two dimensions. And optically speaking, their depth illusion is not dissimilar from that of straight photography, or even better, from that of live viewing from a real-time video feed. Approximate uh, sculptural uh, video work from the same period, Yoko Ono's Sky TV, comes immediately to mind. Is it too much to think, of, uh, is it too much to think about Morris's mirrored cubes as unstable involutions hovering between the conditions of sculpture and photography, or even video? Following Krauss, I suspect that many of us here will think of con contemporary reconfigurations of sculpture or photography less as transformations of media than as conceptual objects, or perhaps what Krauss calls theoretical objects. Um, in juxtaposing sculpture and photography, we could talk about problems of medium, of presence and absence, of comparisons of spatial, temporal, and linguistic expression. However, the singular problem that the mirrored cubes present to me has to do with the relation of vision and spatial distance to an object disappearing into a virtual location, where relations between presence and absence, actual and virtual, become uh, indiscernible. Here I want to turn to another example, which might be considered an inversion of the mirror works of Robert Morris or Robert Smithson. And as I've, as I've already suggested, one might further extend this discussion to the complex relations between sculpture, architecture, and video. The work of uh, Bruce Nauman in the late uh, 60s presents many interesting examples that we're all familiar with. But I'm thinking here of Victor Bergen's situational aesthetics of the late uh, 60s and early 70s, and in particular, an early conceptual work entitled uh, Photopath. Early in his career, Bergen was associated with conceptual art, owing especially to his inclusion in the path-breaking 69 exhibition, When Attitudes Become Form. And his apparent proximity uh, to process-oriented minimal arts, art on the one hand, and the analytical linguistic approaches of art and language and related artists on the other. Yet one way of understanding Bergen's difficult relation with post-minimalism is to consider the trajectory of his practice as less conceptual art than an art of the concept. Considering Bergen's past association with photographic practices, and now principally with digital capture and synthesis, the main issue here is not a reducing of media or medium, but a questioning or interrogation of the concept of medium in works that hold perception in an interstitial space between stillness and movement, presence and absence, image and text, or better yet, the visible and the expressible. Indeed, one hesitates to call Bergen's uh, work photography, sculpture, or even video art, for Bergen is not a visual artist, at least in terms of our ordinary senses of the visual. Um, and in fact, this may be one of his most interesting points of comparison with Morris. Both are constructing virtual images in space, but their conceptions of the virtual are quite different. This is my first point of attraction to Bergen's practice. Drawing from conceptual resources in the philosophical work of Jacques Derrida, Jean-Francois Lyotard, Michel Foucault, and Gilles Deleuze, much of my own work in the last 25 years has aimed at dismantling the concept of the visual and replacing it with the more open concept of the figural. However, the question of this symposium leads me to understand how my work on the figural was guided by the problem of discourse, perhaps too resolutely guided by that problem, and how our terms for criteria of expression in creative practice must be shifted. The relation between photography and sculpture redirects this problem in new and interesting ways. My intent in, compare, in comparing Morris and Bergen's work is to ask the question, across sculpture and photography, what is a virtual image? Though when asking this question, our concept of the virtual and of the image may be transformed. The paradox of Bergen's interest in the virtual image might be understood as questioning the location of the visible in ways commensurate with Deleuze's account in his stunning book on Foucault of the intricate and complex foldings and stratifications of le visible et l'enonçable, 
or what I translate as the visible and the expressible. Here the self-evidence of visuality and discourse dissolve into complex intercalations of the expressive and the visible in different dimensions of space. A correlative space, where, which associates what can be said with what can be seen or observed. Complementary space, which establishes relations between discursive and non-discursive spaces as the institutional basis of power or value and collateral space, where enunciation is defined by specific mutations of plastic space and linguistic reference, or figure and text. In a strong sense, both visuality and discourse lose their substance and identity here and enter into a variety of impure, multi-stable composites. One might say, then, that for Deleuze, there is neither visuality nor discourse, image or enunciation, but rather only expression, whether objective or subjective, or even as something that passes between the objective and the subjective. Deleuze's mappings of the uh, instability of relations between perception and objects, linguistic designation and spatial reference or spatial reproduction and uh, institutional context resonates with conceptual art in terms of what Bergen called in the late 60s, situational aesthetics. Conceptualism's concern with the dematerialization of the art object had two important consequences. One veered toward institutional critique in the aim of producing works that were inseparable from their exhibition spaces and which were themselves non-reproducible as objects of commodity exchange. The other was an interest in art's capacity to produce singular phenomenological events. The derealization of self-sufficient objects thus aimed at another form of realization, to bring perception closer to thought and thought's attention to acts of perception and memory as something inescapably, both interior and exterior, singular and collective, personal and social. Here, the most radical version of conceptualism retreats from or hesitates before the visual, whether in the form of objects or images deployed in space, drawings produced from instruction sets, or the subordination of text to image, as in the theoretical practice of art and language. My philosophical attraction to Bergen's work goes deeper, however. Throughout his long and productive career, Bergen has challenged the visual not by rebalancing the relation of image to text, but rather in investigating the relation between sense and image as components of a practice, where in every instance, uh, which in every instance turns us from perception to thought. Photopath, uh, various iterations from 67 to 69, and other early works demonstrate the first variation of Bergen's interest in the art of the concept. And I would like to examine this work as suspended between the claims of sculpture and photography on perception in relation to reproduction and representation. The components of this practice include, first, the proposal of a set or sets of conditions within which certain concepts can be demonstrated. In turn, these genetic conditions frame the design of creative systems, which may or may not result in standing works. The genetic element for po Photopath is an instruction card, which you have before you, an instruction card that reads, a path along the floor, of proportions one by 21 units photographed. Photographs printed to the actual size of objects and prints attached to the floor so that images are perfectly congruent with their objects. What kind of work is produced by these conditions or this conditioning? One fascinating result of Photopath is its reduction of the relation of an image to its referent to the smallest possible unit of difference in ways that curiously recall Morris's mirrored cubes. Like analog photography, the work is in principle infinitely reproducible though not primarily by the transcriptive automatisms of photographic recording and printing, but rather by the symbolic means of linguistic instruction, as given by the cards. Moreover, the constitutive images, images of the photographs only function as units of selection subordinate to the environmental forms they reproduce, 
such that, as Peter Osborne observes, the indexicality of the photographic image is transformed as a sign of perceptual indifference. Unlike photographic printing, the work produced, if it is produced, is infinitely variable. The result is, again, like Morris's cubes, to produce works uh, that take on the surface features of their different environments. One might also ask, what is the medium of this work? While the instruction card might be displayed in a catalog, the work is attached to the ground, like, paradoxically, a sculptural object. Laid over the floor, it even produces a minimal sense of volume. This is a curious reversal. Where the eye usually locates informative labels, it now finds a linguistic work displayed as if, uh, as if an image. Where one usually locates a sculptural work, the foot finds a trajectory, itself almost but not quite indistinguishable from the environment on which it is overlaid. The instructions themselves are composed in a passive descriptive style. They neither require, command, nor even encourage. Syntactically, they are temporally ambiguous. The words do not request a future where Photopath imagines fulfillment of an aesthetic contract. The instructions can also be read as a retroactive description of a photographic work displayed in the past, a linguistic report of a past accomplishment, or as an account of present work that the text might accompany. Moreover, the work becomes a path, the photopath itself no less than the instruction set that generates it, but a path towards what? Not a physical trajectory, but a mental one, leading to the apprehension of a conceptual object, which is as difficultly located in space, physical or mental, interior or exterior, as it is in time, there and then, here and now, or in some indefinite future. The object of perception here, if we can call it that, is neither produced from reading the printed instruction set nor from viewing the exhibited work. Bergen's situational aesthetics thus aims to provoke or produce events, intentionally formed partly in actual and exterior space and partly in mental interior space, yet neither clearly resolvable to one or the other. These are incorporeal objects, even if they are no doubt experienced in singular physical and institutional circumstances, similar to other institutional placements of sculpture in the era of the expanded field. One might even say that the work itself only exists virtually, as if hovering between complementary space, uh, complementary space, institutional specificity of the installed environment, collateral space, spatial fulfillment of the uh, instructional contract or not, and a correlative space that situates the viewer mentally and conceptually in potential acts of perception, thought, and memory. Do these aesthetic situations produce an image, even if it sits uncomfortably in terms of the visual? Is the image a visual concept or a concept of the visual? All the power and complexity of Deleuze's various conceptualizations of the image, no less than Bergen's situational works, suggest other dimensions of thought. To construct an image or release a percept is to produce a gap or dislocation in perception, and in fact all the potential of the image lies in the interstitial or the in-between, the disjunctive conjunction as an idea, event, or incorporeal series. In other words, the image in a Deleuzean sense cannot occupy space and therefore cannot become an object of vision or visuality. Morris's mirrored cubes also gesture in this direction, in capturing perception and spatial orientation and a hesitation or vacillation between forms deployed in space and their optically virtual representation. My interest in juxtaposing Morris's mirrored cubes with Bergen's photopaths is to trace a genealogy of conceptualizations of the virtual image from sculpture to photography, where both terms should be placed under erasure. Here, the optically virtual images of the mirrored cubes are transformed into the incorporeal objects of Bergen's conceptual work. 
I will start to come to a close here in noting briefly that this critical dialogue between sculpture and photography raises fascinating and complex questions in two areas. One, on the nature of video and, pro and projected image installations. The other, on the disappearance of photography into processes of digital capture and synthesis. In another essay, I have traced this genealogy in Bergen's work from his early conceptualism through his many uh, projected image text works involving variations on video and animated panoramic photography, and finally to his newer series of computer-generated reconstructions of disappeared architectures. This genealogy opens uh, another question worth investigating. Krauss's original Klein groups place sculpture into relation with architecture and landscape. Baker's later Klein groups place photography in relation to narrative and stasis in combinations that ask for contrast with cinematic components of stillness, movement, and projection. The philosophical investigation of conceptual intersections between sculpture and photography might then ask us to imagine where these terms might combine and separate in individual works. The movement out of conceptualism toward photographic practice, text image experimentation, and other hybrid scripto-visual forms, and finally digital video, was fueled by Bergen's realization early on of a specific dilemma. The instruction cards, uh, Bergen explains, and I'm quoting from an interview here, the instruction cards left me with the problem of whether the work was in the instruction or its realization. If it were in the realization, then I was sent back to the physical object. But the instructions alone were incomplete if they referred to something not present. The following instruction, although it's still called for material objects, suggested that a solution to my problem might lie in an act of memory. And the instruction reads thus. Two units coexist in time. Spatial separation is such that units may not simultaneously be directly perceived. Units isomorphic to degree that encounter with second is likely to evoke recollection of first. I subsequently produced sculptures, and Bergen puts it in quotes again, I subsequently produced sculptures that consisted of nothing more than a set of recursive sentences directing the reader's attention to immediate perceptions and memories. This approach to spatial design is also characteristic of many of Bergen's recent installations where related photographic and textual presentations are physically separated from associated projections. Voyage to Italy from 2006 and A Place to Read from 2010 are two opposite examples. I conclude then uh, with a recent work by Bergen, A Place to Read, uh, and this is an uh, installation design view, uh, created in 2010 to commemorate Istanbul's selection as a European capital of culture. One variation of the installed work separates the computer-generated projection in a space separated from a sequence of text in an adjoining room, uh, which themselves might be taken for text pictures familiar from the earlier practice of art and language. And the handout I passed out, just so people would have it, um, is the, uh, the text of the uh, text pictures that line the installation space, in case you're interested. <laughs> One question I would like to raise, and it would count for a great many examples of contemporary art, is to what extent projected image installations might count as sculptures, whose components would include the physical devices of playback and projection and screens and monitors, as well as the ar architectural design of the installed spacers where these works are projected. And if any of you have time, there's a wonderful little show up at Mass Mocha called Dying of the Light, which is exploring this <laughs> exact problem of uh, moving image uh, projection as sculptural works. Um, the title of the work, um, and we're looking at the uh, video component now, the title of the work, A Place to Read, refers to Bergen's digital reconstruction of the Taslik Kav, a coffee house built by Sadad Haki Eldem in the middle of the last century. But the place to read is also the architectural site of the installation itself, 
with its divided rooms and walls that ask us to sequence and combine in the virtual space of memory the textual information presented in one space with the animated projection in the other. And there is one last architectural and potentially sculptural component to take account of. The mathematical and conceptual underpinnings of the optically virtual images produced in Morris's mirrors are related genealogically to the algorithmic procedures of computer-aided design with which Bergen builds and animates his latest projection works. Passing from the virtual landscapes of the Toslik Kav to the physical spaces of the installation shuffles and mixes in new and interesting ways the terms that Krauss and Baker have offered us. Sculpture, sight, landscape, architecture, photography, stillness, movement, narrative, non-narrative, as well as presence and absence, or the actual and the virtual. I will not make any judgments here of the degrees to which this work constructs itself from sculptural and photographic components or concepts. I am not myself very good at Klein sets. But it does open us to many fascinating questions raised by the juxtaposition of sculpture and photography in their variable and evolving expanded fields. Moreover, A Place to Read presents us with a fascinating site for asking my question, what is a virtual image? Bergen's architectural dislocation of contiguous sites of reading, one textual and poetic, the other a digital construction and projection produces what he calls a sequence image. Considered as such, works like Photopath, Photopath or A Place to Read are not resolvable to a sign or an image in the ordinary sense, nor can we locate and anchor a memory that would fix the sense of this sequence image. From Photopath to A Place to Read, Bergen's long and complex body of work makes present the disappearance of photography in the digital image can't get that last page loose. <laughs> Leading to the creation of a virtual image, a new power of memory and thought, real without being actual, ideal without being abstract, as Deleuze might say. With its entirely digital and utopic reconstruction of the Toslik Kav, now itself fragmented and physically displaced, and its dramatic virtual orbit above and around the rooftop and forward transit towards its interests, its entrance, its acceleration of light and time, a place to read entirely displaces the indexical and transcriptive space-time of analog representation with digital synthesis, producing new senses of time and history and novel ways of apprehending the, the presence of disappearing as well as considering the sites of reading in ways that may hover between our conventional senses of photography and sculpture being neither one nor the other, but sharing features of both. Thank you. Thank you, David. A uh, couple questions. Thank you, David. That was wonderful. Um, and it raised an issue for me which hasn't been raised so far, and I think it's an important one. And that is the issue of the architectural model as mm -hmm. sculpture sure. and the sort of the device of virtual reality which came into architecture mm -hmm. in the early 90s and the modeling through AutoCAD and those sorts of systems of um, um, animation of architecture in lieu of the model. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you had reflected a little bit because to me this is what it looks like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How that aspect of uh, the intermediary between architecture as a building mm -hmm. and architecture as a drawing mm -hmm. through the model sort of reflects into this uh, architectural modeling through the computer yeah. and in what relationship it stands to photography. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean <laughs> I'll come back to Bergen, but one of the first things I think about is Thomas DeMond, who has already uh, mentioned today, we could think of him as someone who builds architectural models and photographs them, right, as simulacra, which is another example I would love to talk about. But I think, especially in his more recent work, uh, this is something that's very much in Bergen's mind, uh, especially since um, a lot of the sites he evokes in this projected work um, have, have, have either been torn down 
or partially. Uh, it, uh, some corner of the Toslikov still exists, but it's now been replaced by a very ugly parking lot and hotel complex, right? But it's uh, part of what Bergen is doing is using computer synthesis to, you know, construct a kind of utopic model of this space, um, which is reinforced. I mean, pre people probably haven't had time to read the text, but the wall text presents another kind of narrative. Uh, that you put together in your head before you come see the projection or you see the projection and go read the wall text. But again, it has to do with a, a really interesting play between um, a fairly accurate and, and a very utopic architectural model, but also a kind of fantasy of the space and what it means. And not only the fantasy of the disappeared historical space, but, but Bergen also writes a kind of a science fiction text about um, how this... Um, uh, 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 construction might function in a virtual world. But, but it comes back to your question of the architectural model and what is it and how it functions. Um, and in, in Bergen's case, two things are very, very clear. Um, he's interested in how the virtual resurrects a disappeared space. And he resurrects it with a sense towards creating a utopia or a counter utopia with respect to that disappeared space. Thank you, David, so much for this talk. and. Um, one of the, you mentioned a bunch of various conceptual pairs. Mm -hmm. um, and another one I want to introduce is color and contour, which came up in oh, the sure. introduction. Mm -hmm. And I had a quick sort of factual question for you about the photopath piece. Mm -hmm. Were the photographic mm, prints that are laid on the floor in the gallery in color? Are they in black and white? And if so, how could he have matched? I mean, it's fascinating yeah. that the way that piece is in turn reproduced in, say, the picture that from the Edinburgh Gallery that you showed is itself black and white. And I think of conceptual <laughs> art as always in black and white. <laughs> and I started thinking about how color matching, if yeah. everything else could be matched and mm -hmm. laid one to one, mm -hmm. how color still would have been irritating if they were in color, like the floorboards would have been a yeah, certain thing. You know, um, and sorry, and I just wanted to think about that in connection to this piece about rendering and this computer rendering that architects use all the time, but how color might also disturb this dream of total reconstruction. I mean, mm -hmm. the color seems even more of a phantasmatic yeah, yeah. projection. So I, I wanted you to talk a little bit more. About yeah, well, there's no question that the use of color um, um, in these pieces, um, as well as black and white, some of the recent pieces alternate between color and black and white, um, is, is, is playing with the, you know, the utopic surfaces that Bergen's looking for. Um, I was going to say something else about that. It just slipped my mind. Maybe I'll come back to it. About Photopath, you know, I have to double check because I have mostly seen um, uh, black and white uh, um, reproductions uh, of it or, or them. Uh, but I have in my mind that I don't know whether it's phantasmatic or not, um, that I have seen a color reproduction. Um, that, um, but of course, what's I can't promise myself I, I, that I saw this and didn't fantasize it. But what I imagine in <laughs> this image in my head is that it's, it, it's quite interesting because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious. What's interesting about the work is, is how much it is similar and how much it is different, right? And so um, uh, uh, the photographic reproduction of the, the color of the wood is going to be imperfect no matter what. And I think that's part of the work because what it's trying to do is play with this tension between um, similarity and difference. Um, but I have to look into that. Now I'm, nobody asked me that. Now I'm curious to know for sure. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. We have a last question. Oh, was I that fast? Yeah. Uh, hi, I, I think that you're raising fundamental definitional problems that we've, in a way, fortunately probably avoided and having to do with what is a photograph and what is sculpture and even what is an image. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I was just struck by, first of all, the fact that no one has, we haven't really talked about the fact that the photograph can be sculptural. I mean, there are, yes. it doesn't have to be, in, in any sense, a, a, a flat item. The other thing that struck me looking at the Bergen piece was that I think I have a different concept of the virtual than maybe yours or maybe the popular concept well, of virtual I used to, reality. I used to several. <laughs> yeah, because I, to me that piece um, is in much more the tradition of trompe l'oeil, and mm. that at some level 
it isn't so dissimilar mm -hmm. from trying to imitate an effect mm -hmm. with one medium of, of another sure. and, the, and and therefore it's 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 a material thing and mm -hmm. I felt that a lot of the things that you were speaking of as images as if they were were virtual in the sense of being immaterial to me mm -hmm. are material objects in fact your opening statement about photograph the pho photography has disappeared in the image you know you can't tell that to the uh, people flocking to Mi Miami or Basel <laughs> to purchase them the photograph is still very active as a, as a thing so could you maybe spin that out or you know what would in fact what is your definition of the virtual or yeah in some I mean, sense this is still material as a oh absolutely and uh, I mean the first thing I can you. say even though I gesture to several different uh, definitions so for example the mirror cubes only work because they're working on the physical and optical printal principle of virtual images which is expressed mathematically um, but of course that same mathematics goes into the perspective construction happening here but you know no matter where I'm sliding with that definition of the virtual uh, the virtual is not something that is absent it's, it's also part of a presence so if you, if you think of the mirrored cubes which are you know just you know, uh, six mirrors you know uh, assembled into a cube um, what's interesting about their effect on the space is that they're, they're physically present sculptural objects, right? Yes, yet they are kind of blending with their environments in ways that, that plays between uh, a kind of indiscernibility or a, a, a fluctuation or vacillation between the, the, the literally physically present and what is a virtual image. Uh, and one could say the same thing about various kinds of digital projections as well. Um, um, also because they also, they also de usually depend on a physical architectural apparatus, right? So the main point is to think about the variety of ways, which you're already doing and pushing me to do, in which um, uh, what, however one defines the virtual, it is also being expressed in something ma material and physical. And what interests me in those cases in which you have, and Thomas DeMond's work is another good example of this, in which you have a kind of you know, duck-rabbit problem of <laughs> what is there and what is not, what are you seeing, is it really what you're seeing? Um, and also the way in which, I mean, the other thing that, and there's a third definition here, which is uh, something that, that Bergen is interested in, is you know, where do you hold the meaning of this work in your head? You know, you're, you're kind of building one image as you walk around and read this series of law texts, but they relate to the video. Um, and so once you've left them behind, you're still holding them present in your memory with respect to this work. And something, uh, and Bergen's very clear about this in his own writings about his work, that, that basically, you know, for him, the sense of his works reside in people's memory, not in their perception. And that's what he's trying to, to organize uh, in his work. And so this idea of, of, of memory, <laughs> which is interior to us, would be another dimension of the virtual as it were. Great. Thanks very much, David. Thank you.